and it was absolutely horrifying. That's one of the worst moments of my entire life, but the best phone call I got was saying that they were okay. I'm glad that they're okay. Breaking news tonight, a sixth grader has been killed during a school shooting in Iowa. It was the first day back to class after winter break. I'm Emily Iketa in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. In addition to killing a sixth grader, police say the gunman injured five other people. Four of the injured were students, and one was a school administrator. The deadly shooting happened this morning at a high school in Perry, Iowa, a town of just around 8,000 people, which is about 40 miles outside of the state capital of Des Moines. Police identified the shooter as 17-year-old Dylan Butler, whom they say was a student at the high school. They also tell us he died after apparently shooting himself. Right now, police say Butler acted alone, yet they do not have a motive for the attack. NBC News correspondent Adrian Broadus joins me now in Perry. Adrian, thanks for being here. What are we learning about the victims? Well, let's start with that sixth grader. We just spoke with a woman who says that sixth grader lived in her neighborhood. She described that child as the sweetest kid, someone who always looked out for the younger children in the neighborhood. We know the sixth grader was killed, as well as four other students who were injured at the high school. We also learned that a school administrator was also injured. Tonight, the community of Perry is coming together, and there's one question that's top of mind. Why? There was a vigil that took place here just moments ago. There's still a handful of people here. And one thing that I'd like to underscore that people at this vigil said, while they may want to know why this happened in their community, that's an answer they may never have. We do know this teen was a 17 year old student at the high school. Investigators say that he had a pump action shotgun as well as a small caliber handgun. And at the time of the shooting, there were several social media posts, according to members of law enforcement, made by the shooter. Back to you. Adrian, another school shooting, this time in a town of just 8,000 people. Tell us, how is the community of Perry doing tonight? Well, we saw hundreds of people here for the vigil that I mentioned, and you could really see in that number, unity. There was an older woman in the crowd who attended this high school, and her daughter also attended the high school, and she whispered, this is nice. And she said that this vigil that was held here tonight was comforting. So we saw people coming together, but again, there are still so many questions and these are answers that they're waiting on. They want to know what is the motive, but not only do they want to know what the motive is, they also want to know how those other students who were injured are doing because we did learn that at least one person is in critical condition, but that uh, person is not, that person doesn't have life-threatening injuries. Back to you. Adrian Bratis, thanks so much for your reporting on the ground there in Iowa. Just heart-wrenching. NBC News law enforcement analyst and former chief of Seattle Police Department, Carmen Best, joins us now. Carmen, I want to start with some of what police said earlier today about the shooter. Watch here. Butler was armed with a pump-action shotgun and a small-caliber handgun. Butler also made a number of social media posts in and around the time of the shooting. Law enforcement is working to secure those pieces of evidence. All evidence thus far suggests that Butler acted alone. Carmen, we know early stages of the investigation right now, but what jumps out to you about the evidence so far? Well, let's be honest with you, as sad as this is and what a tragedy for this uh, small town, it's that we, it's just um, almost as if it's rinse and repeat with the number of mass shootings this year uh, we're you know we're just a few days into the year and we've had five so far uh, including this one today so uh, what stands out is that they're you know they do have evidence it is in fact a young person uh, that was uh, you know a, a familiar with the school and a student there as I understand it um, so it is one of those incidents that we unfortunately have become so used to seeing uh, these days. Uh, and it seems to me that the law enforcement uh, response was swift and rapid. 
uh, to get there. Um, in this case, it sounds like the, uh, the suspect um, had a self-inflicted um, gunshot wound uh, and on its own. But again, another tragedy that we have seen so many times. Yeah, let's dive into the response a little bit more. We know that every minute counts in these kinds of situations. We've heard some of the harrowing accounts from students who were in the school. What did you make of the reaction from first responders? Yeah, I would, like I was saying, I think the first response, uh, first responders acted quickly. My understanding, they got there in uh, just minutes of, uh, of the reporting of the shooting. Um, unfortunately, and sadly, this is something that uh, law enforcement trains for all the time. Even as my tenure in the Seattle Police Department, we responded to different multiple shootings like this. Uh, it's a sad event, but it is something that ever since Col Columbine, uh, we know that uh, law enforcement trains to respond to these types of incidents. And the schools are also training kids on how to shelter in place or uh, run, fight, or hide uh, in these circumstances. Chief Carmen Best, thank you so much for being with us. Tonight, another trove of documents related to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein has just been unsealed, right, as we are learning more about the 900-plus pages of unsealed court documents released in a New York federal court last night. Now, those first set of documents appear to reference Epstein's relationships with some of the world's most rich and powerful people, like former President Donald Trump and Bill Clinton and Britain's Prince Andrew. We should underscore, none of those documents include allegations of wrongdoing for Trump or Clinton related to Epstein. Yet the documents contain a witness statement claiming Prince Andrew groped her at Epstein's house in New York in 2001. As for what is in the second batch of documents, we'll turn now to NBC News legal analyst Angela Senadella. Thanks for joining us and staying on this with us. We know it's early, but any takeaways from this new batch of documents? Yeah, there's a lot of interesting information in here that I've already seen. And I think what's most intriguing is the list of possible witnesses on both sides, both for the plaintiff, who was in this case, Virginia Dufresne, in this defamation lawsuit, and then on the other side, a possible witness that is being tossed around for the defense, who would have been for Ghislaine Maxwell. And to start with the defense, there are allegations here that there is a journalist, Sharon Churcher, who is a British journalist who allegedly worked with Jufri to uh, to make up fake claims or to aggrandize them to in order to sell her book. And so this could possibly really deflate a lot of the credibility that Jufri has in terms of her claims regarding Andrew and Dershowitz, because these were very pointed claims that Jufri made. Now, on the other side, what's also very interesting, though, the list of possible witnesses for the plaintiff. And here we have some direct information of who had knowledge of the defendant's conduct, at least from Jufri's perspective. So those, that list includes, that I'm seeing so far, Dershowitz, Prince Andrew, Prince Andrew's records custodian, Bill Richardson, Glenn Dubin, Leslie Wexner, Frederick Fakai, and the staff at Mar-a-Lago between 1999 and 2002. Now look, this is not verified. We don't know for sure whether or not any of these people really did have direct information, but at least that is what is alleged here by the plaintiff, by Jufri, in requests for deposit depositions and also as a possible witness list for trial. Because remember, all of this is preparation for the defamation trial where, uh, where Ghislaine Maxwell allegedly called or allegedly committed defamation by calling Jufri a liar. So that is the most explosive from this. And we also have, in this witness list, may have information of conduct, which includes Bill Clinton and Doug Band, and also photos of Maxwell at Chelsea Clinton's wedding. So these are some of the things I'm seeing already, although there's likely more in these documents, Emily. Yeah, so let's take a look at even how we got here in the first place. These documents all came to light because of a lawsuit from one of Epstein's victims, Virginia Dufresne, as you mentioned, against Epstein's associate, Ghislaine Maxwell. Here's what Dufresne's attorney had to say earlier. There was an immense amount of information about the sex trafficking operation that was all under seal. Part of this is understanding who helped facilitate the trafficking, who was around, who knew about it. Angela, in looking at the documents last night and tonight, what do we ultimately learn about who helped facilitate the trafficking? Well, 
To be clear, even though there are lots of names that are involved and entangled here, the bulk of these allegations are really against Epstein and Maxwell. And the most heartbreaking of these depositions involve both those figures. So I don't know that we can really say any of these people necessarily facilitated, but we do know that it appears, at least from many depositions and victims' testimony, that there was a sense that Epstein and Maxwell felt just totally powerful, all powerful, because they felt that the people that they socialized with, which included this list allegedly, could somehow protect them from prosecution. But it was Virginia Dufresne and this lawyer and a very tenacious spirit that brought it all crumbling down through this single defamation lawsuit, because it's from this trove of documents that the FBI investigations and criminal prosecutions even happened. NBC's Angela Sinadella putting those hundreds of pages of documents into layman's terms for us. Thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We're just getting started. Up next, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is headed to the Middle East as tensions rise across the region, especially at Israel's northern border with Lebanon. And the 2024 election season is about to begin. We'll tell you what you need to know ahead of the Iowa caucus. All this and more is straight ahead, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. 24 people are hurt after a New York subway train rear-ended a work train at a station in Manhattan, causing the work train to derail. It happened around 3 this afternoon local time. The collision led to a major disruption of subway service in the city. A top transit official says the work train had its emergency brakes vandalized, which kept it from leaving the station when it was hit. Former President Donald Trump's businesses received almost $8 million in payments from foreign governments during his time in the White House. That's according to new evidence released by House Democrats today. The documents show 20 different countries made the payments to Trump's businesses during a two-year period. China paid the most, sending over more than $5.5 million to Trump-owned properties. A Trump Organization spokesperson says Democrats released the information to distract from the Republicans' impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. A Texas father and son have been charged in connection with the murder of a pregnant teenager and her boyfriend. The 19-year-old son was charged with capital murder while his father was charged with abuse of a corpse for allegedly helping to move the bodies. 18-year-old Savannah Soto and her 22-year-old boyfriend were found shot dead in a car. Police say the deaths were related to a botched drug deal. A Florida man has been arrested after making threats to kill Congressman Eric Swalwell and his children. A criminal complaint says 72-year-old Mark Shapiro left a bunch of threatening voicemails at Swalwell's office saying, I will, quote, kill you and your children. And it's not the first time. Shapiro was released on bail and has an arraignment scheduled later this month. And a child playing with a cigarette lighter was what caused a large fire that damaged the home of Miami Dolphins wide receiver Tyreek Hill. This, according to local fire officials, calling it accidental. Family members were home at the time, but thankfully, no one was injured. Tonight, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on his way to the Middle East for the fourth time since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. His visit comes as concerns grow over a larger conflict in the region. Today, ISIS claimed responsibility for yesterday's bombing attack in Iran. NBC News has not yet verified this claim by ISIS. Authorities now say the attack killed 84 people. And in Lebanon, huge crowds gathered for the funeral of a senior Hamas leader killed in a drone strike carried out by Israel earlier this week. Hezbollah is now warning of retaliation over the killing. Meanwhile, the situation in Gaza is growing more dire by the day. Israeli strikes continue to bombard the region, killing people in some areas initially declared safe zones. Today, in a statement, the Palestine Red Crescent expressed, quote, deep concerns over their safety of some of their staff who are taking shelter at Gaza's Al-Amal Hospital, which they claim has been attacked for two straight weeks. In one instance, they say even killing a five-day-old baby. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins me now. Josh, what can we expect from the Secretary of State's trip this time? 
Well, you just ticked through a long list of countries in the region where there have been uh, outbreaks of violence in the last few days. And so a big part of Secretary Blinken's trip uh, will be aimed at trying to tamp down those tensions and really prevent uh, a widening war from erupting throughout the Middle East. But he also uh, has a long laundry list of agenda items when he visits Israel to work out with the Israelis, uh, including about getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza, getting those hostages out. Uh, and this could be a very difficult visit. The State Department spokesman Matt Miller acknowledging uh, there could be some uncomfortable moments. Take a look. We don't expect every conversation on this trip to be easy. There are obviously tough issues facing the region and difficult choices ahead. But the secretary believes it is the responsibility of the United States of America to lead diplomatic efforts to tackle those challenges head on. And he is prepared to do that in the days to come. U.S. officials say the toughest agenda item for the secretary will be here in Israel discussing what happens in the Gaza Strip after the war is over, because the U.S. and Israel have really been at odds publicly about who should govern the Gaza Strip. The U.S. wants to see the Palestinian Authority in charge there. The Israelis tonight re releasing a plan that they say would involve uh, local entities within Gaza that are not hostile uh, to Israel uh, taking responsibility for local governance. Uh, but right now, they have not put a lot of meat on the bones in terms of what that would actually look like. Josh, let's zoom out a bit. Hezbollah is warning of retaliation over the killing of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut. We saw those deadly explosions in Iran just yesterday. To what degree is the conflict in the Middle East expanding? Well, it certainly has been an escalation of tensions on a number of different fronts. And now we've heard from the Israeli military chief of staff saying they're really on an extremely high state of readiness uh, for a potential new front in this war erupting uh, on their northern border uh, with Lebanon, where that assassination of that Hamas uh, operative took place just a couple of days ago. Uh, but right now, uh, the Israelis and other parties in the region seem to be trying to prevent an all-out war has been law has not retaliated uh, as much as had been feared. And so uh, the hope right now is that this can be contained locally to simply an Israel-Hamas war. And Josh, I understand you're learning new details about a secret operation that saw the rescue of the mother and uncle of a U.S. service member from Gaza. What can you tell us about that secret operation and what it means for others still there? Yeah, so we want to be clear. These were not hostages in the Gaza Strip, but these were civilians who are in Gaza, who are the relatives of Americans who want to get out of the Gaza Strip. And earlier in the war, we saw hundreds of American citizens leave the Gaza Strip uh, into Egypt. That apparently was not possible uh, for these individuals because uh, of their location in northern Gaza with Hamas terrorists surrounding them. Uh, and so according to the Israelis, there was an operation uh, that involved coordination with both the U.S. and Egypt to actually rescue them uh, from Gaza and bring them safely out of the Gaza Strip uh, to the great relief of their families. They are now safely out of Gaza. Josh Letterman, thank you so much for your reporting. Stay safe. And staying in the Middle East, attacks by Houthi rebels have caused carriers to divert more than $2 billion in trade from the Red Sea. Now, national security officials here and abroad are threatening to respond if the attacks continue. It's also led to shipping firms pausing shipments altogether, now creating delays and higher freight costs, which means it may take longer for people to get their packages even thousands of miles away from the conflict. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby has more. Emily, this week, top national security officials in the Biden administration met to discuss options to respond to the continued attacks against merchant vessels in the Red Sea by Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now, yesterday, Wednesday, the officials got together at the National Security Council to discuss possible options beyond what we've already seen. The Biden administration spearheaded this maritime task force that's now in effect. It's more than 20 nations that have come together to provide ships, aircraft, and personnel to try to, to try to defend against these continued attacks by the Houthis in both the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb that have really impacted shipping throughout that area. Since the task force, which is called Operation Prosperity Garden, Guardian, since it began on December 18th, the, we are told, according to Navy officials, that 1,500 merchant ships have transited that area and none have been struck by any of these Houthi attacks. But 
The attacks have continued, including even today, when Houthis used a new tactic. In this case, what they, they used what we would call a sea drone. So a drone, but that rides along the sea rather than flying through the air like we normally think of a, a drone doing. This one was launched today from the Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen, and it transited out about 15 miles into the busy shipping lanes in their southern Red Sea and then detonated. Now, it came within a couple of miles of some commercial and U.S. Navy ships in the region, but no one was impacted, no ships, no individuals, no casualties reported. But that is now the 20 fifth attack reported by Houthi, mil Houthi militants since mid-November. Biden administration's n officials now responding, considering some options, including potential strikes against, the against these militants inside of Yemen. Now, it's important to say nothing has been ordered. There has nothing, nothing is, is, um, is, is underway right now. But the fact that the administration officials now are really going through these options and really considering them is just it shows how seriously they are taking this. Not only the threat to commercial ships and U.S. military ships and allied ships all in the region, but the real concern that this is having an impact on global shipping right now. Emily. OK, something we will be following closely. Courtney Kuby, thanks so much. Coming up, a big old snowstorm is headed to the East Coast. We'll have that forecast for you after the break. But first, you've got to see this. A limited edition release of the viral Stanley Cup is causing chaos at Target stores across the nation. That's right. The newest Stanley Quencher was released yesterday, available for a limited time in winter pink and only sold at Target. Eager for the chance to buy one, fans of the product camped out overnight and waited in long lines. Some stores got rowdy with video Videos of scuffles over the tumbler posted to TikTok. Already the cups bought for $49.95 yesterday are popping up on resale sites for as much as $300. Anyone else having flashbacks to trying to get Taylor Swift tickets? We'll be right back. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. In San Francisco, suicide prevention nets along the Golden Gate Bridge were installed this week. And nearly 20 feet wide, the nets were added to both sides of the 1.7 mile long bridge. More than 2,000 people have plunged to their deaths since the Golden Gate Bridge opened in 1937. In New Mexico, we're seeing new video from a disturbance that happened inside a juvenile detention center on Christmas Day. Officials say the inmates covered cameras, blocked doors with furniture, and even had weapons like scissors. It took police hours to get it all under control. Three of the teens were hurt at the time, and now more than a dozen of them could face charges. In San Diego, that rough surf from storms there last week has caused some damage along the coastline. Crews have closed several piers in the area as they figure out if they need any repairs. Some of the beaches have some pretty extensive erosion. Waves in the area even got as high as 10 feet. And in a new NBC News exclusive sit down, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is firing up his criticism of former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. In a joint interview with NBC News and the Des Moines Register, DeSantis denied he's fighting her for second place in the GOP presidential race and called her phony. But you're then much my closer in the race the to Nikki Haley than you are to Trump. What happened? Well, no. I mean, first of all, Trump has always been leading in the race. I mean, he's the former president. He's uh, one of the most famous people in there. But you're not even the top there. challenger so to we're, him now. We are the top. Um, they wouldn't be spending that money if we weren't the top. I'm the only one that has a chance to beat Trump and win the general election. Nikki Haley can't get conservative voters. DeSantis also talked about his campaign and how he's faring against Donald Trump. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us with more. Hey, Dasha. Hey, Emily. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis started this campaign as the top contender to former President Trump. But now he's locked in a battle for second place with Nikki Haley. When I asked him about that, he disputed that premise. But he spent a whole lot of the interview really going after Nikki Haley, using some of his sharpest attacks yet, really escalating his tone when it comes to Haley. Uh, he also went after former President Trump in a, kind of a new way, really going after his legal battles and the 
the jeopardy that they put uh, the Republican Party in. And when it comes to Haley, he called her a phony, said that she can't win over conservative voters. And let me tell you, Iowa for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is do or die. He has invested a whole ton, really the majority of his resources in this state. So he has to have a strong showing here, though over the course of his campaign, he's kind of played down expectations here at first saying that he was going to win Iowa, then his campaign saying that he doesn't have to win, that a second place finish is just fine. And then recently uh, saying that Iowa is not a deciding factor, that it's really all about accumulating delegates. And when we talked about the path forward beyond Iowa, well, he wasn't able to really articulate one. Take a listen. You've put all your eggs in the Iowa basket. That's can not true. Can you name another that, state that think you true. could win? That's not true. Can you name another state you could win? Yes, yes. You wait till what, what happens when we get out of Iowa. It's going to create, another a, state create a lot win? of... We're going to be able to win a lot of states. We have a great can organization in New Hampshire. We have a great organization in South Do you Carolina. Think you win New Hampshire? We can have a lot of great organizations throughout Super Tuesday. So you're going to see this is very dynamic. Uh, you're going to see it's a long process, um, and we're going to be able uh, to win. So stay tuned. But to say that we've put all the eggs is not true. Uh, we have great uh, organization and field programs in the early states, uh, and we're going to compete in all of them. And Emily, we also did ask DeSantis about the tragic shooting that happened here in Iowa today, just uh, not too far from Des Moines. And he said that gun laws should remain at the state and local level. I asked if he would make any changes to gun policy at the federal level, and uh, he said he would not make any changes if he were in the Oval Office. Emily? Dasha Burns on the campaign trail. Thanks so much. The tri-state area is facing its first major winter storm of the season this weekend. Some areas might see major snowfall for the first time and get this, almost two years. Here's NBC meteorologist Bill Karens on what to expect. Hey, Bill. Well, good evening to you, Emily. And this is storm number one, and we got two big ones right behind this. So we'll start with this first one, and then we'll get into how active this weather pattern is going to be over the next week and a half. So we already have the snow coming down uh, in areas of New Mexico, winter storm warnings in a few areas. It's now snowing in Amarillo. Tonight, the snow will break out in Wichita. Not a huge ordeal, but in the morning, you'll be you know, having to do a little bit of shoveling and scraping off of the windshield. And then the big stuff will be as we head towards Saturday and then into Sunday in the northeast and the mid Atlantic. Atlantic. Right now, 23 million will up that number as this storm begins to get a little closer to areas on the East Coast. So the snow forecast over the next four days, this is what's going to happen tonight. And we get the white, that's just a kind of a coating to about one inch. The blue is like, you know, enough to have to probably do a little bit of shoveling. So nothing too ordeal, too big. Kansas City area, some snow showers. You may see some snow in St. Louis. It won't be a big problem. But it's as we go into the areas of the northeast. That's where all the issues are going to be. Not I-95. From I-95 to the coast, that's where we're going to go from snow initially in some cases over to rain. It's going to be too warm. Uh, so we're not expecting really any accumulation, especially on the roads from D.C., Baltimore, Philly to New York. Now, the grassy surfaces may get some, and then inland areas have a chance for even getting significant. So that's going to be the problem. And then once you're interior, then it's plenty cold enough, all snow. Someone's going to get up to about, you know, 8 to 12 inches here, especially the higher terrain near the Catskills, uh, the southern portions of Vermont, the Berkshires, the hills outside of Worcester. That area here is where it could get nailed. So as far as the storm pattern goes, after that storm exits on Sunday, we got this series of storms. We got one, we got two, and three. So the first one is this one that I just talked about heading to the northeast. This is Friday uh, into areas of the south. And then this weekend, another storm is going to dip down from the coastline of British Columbia into the west. This one's going to have snow with it. It's going to have rain. It's going to have windy conditions. And this one will go into the middle of the country and be a huge storm. I mean, it's going to be like a winter hurricane. There's going to be blizzard problems. We're going to have severe weather, maybe even tornadoes in the Gulf. The east coast is going to get heavy rain, warm temperatures, melting snow, flooding. This storm is going to be worse, much worse than the storm that's going to hit the northeast this weekend. And then a third storm potentially after that, well, towards the end of next week into the weekend after this one. So, yeah, you get the idea. And this is how much snow over the next seven days is possible in the west. This pink high end, it's up to 18 inches, almost all of the mountainous areas. So if you haven't had snow yet or significant snow, there's a good chance it's going to happen as winter moves in. Uh, all the Cascades, the Sierra, the Wasatch Range is going to get some good snow for the first time. Even the mountains of Colorado, it has been pretty barren. Uh, they're going to get it too. And so here's how the weekend looks. There's that mess in the east on Saturday. Here's that storm I just talked about that's going to be a big one. Uh, that's Saturday on the west coast. Then by Sunday, 
Monday. There's that snow and wind. And then this next storm is right behind it in the Four Corner region. And that one will head into the middle of the country and cause huge issues as we go throughout the beginning and middle of next week, Emily. So as I was mentioning, uh, it was quiet up to this point this winter. That is all about the change. Okay, so I'll get my snow and rain, rain boots out then. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Here in New York, there's a unique program working to keep young people out of the criminal justice system by using some of their own peers. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has more on how it all works. All rise. This is not your typical courtroom drama. From the prosecutors... Prosecution recommends 20 hours of community service. ...to the jury... Well, we're here to help them, not to punish them so much. ...even all the way up to the judge. How do you wish to plead? Guilty or not guilty? Everyone here, a teenager with a big job, in charge of resolving real cases in Westchester County, New York. It's all part of a local court diversion program, an alternative to a criminal trial that allows teens facing low-level misdemeanors a second chance. Up on today's docket, the case of a stolen bike. My client had absolutely zero intention of stealing someone else's property and causing concern to the victim. 17-year-old Aida Noel hopes to go to law school one day. I love my law and order. I love all my shows. Today, she's representing a peer. When I came in, I was ready to see the worst in people. I was ready for the kids to be closed off, for them to like not have any care. And every single client that I have had has always came into my meeting with a smile on their face. Her real mission in this work is what's known as restorative justice, a theory that balances accountability to the community with fair consequences. I think that is what is most important about youth court is not having that record, getting that second chance. When you have a record, there are so many things in your future that you just can't do. It's so much harder to get a job. Instead of a criminal record, a typical result here includes counseling and community service. This one mistake should not define their life. Connie Jones is the program's director and a legal assistant. How many kids a month would you say you're seeing? Between seven and 10. Wow, yes. That's a lot. But that's, a, that's seven to 10 kids we saved. So that's a big deal. 18-year-old Alexis De La Cruz went through the youth court a few years back. Now, he's studying to become a police officer. Everywhere I go, I'm aware of the law, and that makes me feel like a more powerful person. Knowledge is power at the end of the day. And he's not the only success story. Jones says the program is remarkably effective at making sure the kids who come through the door don't make the same mistake twice. You've only had one repeat, one repeat in nine years. Yes. The program has become so popular, Joan says she has a waiting list of students more than willing to go through the intense weeks-long training program. But 16-year-old Emily Portillo says it can be hard when judging kids her own age. I knew that we were going to take on cases, but I didn't think they were going to be real. Learning that they were real cases and like we're going to have the responsibility to make our statements and the questions, it was just like, oh wow, this is like actual serious stuff. Serious stuff, but with a rewarding outcome and friendships made along the way. And all these people, they're like family to me, they're wonderful. On the night we saw the kids in action, they were gearing up to tackle the case of that stolen bike, gliding through cross-examination. Did you sell the bike for profit? Then it's time for closing arguments. The goal of Youth Court is to help their clients understand and repair the damages they have done to the community. The jury now off to deliberate, huddled together in a hallway. He didn't really do this on purpose. Finally, the verdict is in. 15 hours of community service, six counseling sessions with a counselor from the Youth Bureau, and an essay to the Youth Court explaining your actions. Court is over for the day. But for Aida and so many others, the lessons will last a lifetime. I just find so much joy, like just pure happiness to be able to help others and be a voice for people who can't be a voice for themselves. Laura Jarrett, NBC News. Oh, we love that. And after the break, a new weight loss drug might become easier to get a hold of. That's coming up, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. It continues to be a race against time to find earthquake survivors in Japan. 
The magnitude 7.6 earthquake hit the Noto Peninsula, which sits in the Sea of Japan on Monday. It was followed by a series of aftershocks. Emergency crews say survival rates dropped significantly 72 hours after a quake. Still, the Japanese prime minister says the country must put all of its efforts towards rescuing people. Local officials say the number of dead is now at least 84. Convicted murderer and former Olympian Oscar Pistorius is scheduled to be released from a South African prison tomorrow. Pistorius continues to claim he shot his model girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, by accident in 2013. Prosecutors say he killed her intentionally during an argument. Steenkamp's family did not fight the parole application for Pistorius, who served nine years of a 13-year sentence. He will remain under correctional supervision for the next several years. A deep freeze has hit Sweden, Finland, and Norway, knocking out power for thousands. Several sections of a highway have been closed, leaving people stuck in their cars. Today, a Finnish town on the Norwegian border recorded the country's lowest temperature this winter, negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And even colder temperatures are being forecast for the rest of the week. And unsold Christmas trees become elephant food in Germany. It's an annual event for the Berlin Zoo. Officials there say they only use fresh trees that didn't get a home for the holidays. Also tonight, legal showdowns at the border. It's Texas facing off against the DOJ and New York. The Biden administration is suing over a Lone Star state law that would let police arrest and deport immigrants. And New York's mayor is suing against migrant transfers to the city. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is in Eagle Pass, Texas, with the latest breaking it all down. Yeah, it is a quiet day here in Eagle Pass, but a much more active one in the courtrooms, it seems, with Texas fielding challenges not just from the federal government, but now uh, from the city of New York as well. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Adams there, suing more than 15 charter bus companies asking for about $700 million in damages because that is the cost that the city has taken on to care for the migrants that have arrived in those charter buses from Texas to New York City, all part of Governor Greg Abbott's plan to illuminate the problem uh, in what he calls sanctuary cities. In the meantime, uh, the Department of Justice has also sued the state of Texas over their new law that would give state authorities the ability to arrest migrants for illegally crossing. The DOJ calls that new law unconstitutional, stressing that it is strictly the federal government's responsibility when it comes to border security. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, not shy at all about voicing his opinion, saying that he likes his chances in court uh, when it comes to challenging this new law. In the meantime, here in Eagle Pass, it is a relatively quiet day from those record months we saw last fall. Uh, however, nobody expects this lull to last much longer, especially members of the Texas DPS Tactical Marine Unit. These are troopers we embedded with traveling the Rio Grande on boats who tell me their job has essentially shifted from a law enforcement one where they were trying to intercept smugglers or cartel members to now a humanitarian effort. Now, one trooper, they tell me, uh, with the unit has not pulled a migrant from the Rio Grande in trying to save their life. They call this river deceptively dangerous and say that what began with maybe small groups coming across can at a moment's notice turn into a situation where thousands are crossing uh, in a single day and that the word overwhelmed cannot begin to describe how they feel uh, when they can only have so many resources to handle uh, an unprecedented number of people coming across the border. It was those record numbers that brought U.S. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson here down to the border yesterday where he said that the Biden administration has not acted fast enough to curb this ongoing crisis. Meanwhile, the president has pointed out to the fact that uh, Republicans in Congress uh, have not given him the necessary funds to handle uh, the ongoing issue here. So the back and forths on multiple levels continue. Uh, all of that to say that folks here in these border communities and for the law enforcement that patrol this river tell me they don't know what the exact answer is they just know that they need one sooner than later. We'll send it back to you. Morgan Chesky breaking down all the legal back and forth. Thank you.
Zepbound is the latest drug in a growing weight loss medication market. And today, the drug's maker, Eli Lilly, announced a new program to make some of their medications, including Zepbound, easier to get. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the story. Lynn Fendlison has diabetes and has struggled with her weight as long as she can remember. The 56-year-old Alabama author says she began asking her doctor about Ozempic in 2020. She says he eventually prescribed it but kept her on a low dose for a year, even though her weight wasn't changing. So she asked about a higher dose or other medications. You felt like you needed to keep raising the issue. That's it. I have seen physicians who almost seem afraid to be proactive with people who are overweight. And I think that really impedes getting access to good care. Both Ozempic and Manjaro are drugs for treating diabetes, but also used off-label for weight loss. Wigovi and Zepbound are now the approved versions of the two drugs specifically intended for fighting obesity. But as Lynn discovered, securing a prescription for any of these drugs can be a challenge. Eli Lilly's CEO Dave Ricks says his company is now trying to change that. I think a lot of people think of obesity as an issue of willpower. It's not. You know, 40% of adult Americans have excess weight or obesity. That's a big number. Uh, from here, you can The pharmaceutical see giant today launching Lilly Direct, a website where patients can find a doctor in person or via telehealth who can, if appropriate, prescribe certain medicines, among them Zetbound, which can then ship directly to the patient's door. Obviously, there are going to be questions from people about safety, about oversight. Can you explain the role of physicians um, and just healthcare professionals in this? Yeah, model? it's a critical part of how the site works. And these drugs need to be used under the supervision of a physician. And we're just offering more choice in that regard. Are these independent physicians? Will they get any kind of incentives for prescribing Zetbound or your drugs? How does that relationship look? Yeah, key question. There is no rela financial relationship between us and the physicians or the online uh, telehealth platforms. In clinical trials, patients taking Zetbound lost 21% of their body weight. Approved by the FDA in November, Wall Street analysts expect it to bring in billions of dollars in sales this year. Some critics have concerns, including that easier access could mean misuse of the drug by those who simply want to lose a few pounds. But they're trying hard to make sure that you can find a path to something that they absolutely want to sell you. That creates at least the appearance of conflict of interest. Zepbound's list price is just over $1,000 for a month's supply and is not covered by Medicare or many insurance plans. Rick says direct access via the new site isn't about business. This is about patient success. Our sales will be the same either way, whether we sell it to uh, CVS or Walgreens or sell it on our website. As for Lynn, who eventually had her dosage increased and says she lost 65 pounds, she's all for making weight loss medications more accessible. It shuts off the constant thought of food. I feel like a normal person. A feeling Eli Lilly is trying to make easier to come by for others. Maggie Vespa, thanks so much. Before we go, it's time for the future of everything. For the first time in history, Tetris was defeated. Yep, that's right. The essentially unwinnable game was beat by a 13-year-old. We'll have that story for you after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. California is looking to change the way it operates its prison system. The Department of Corrections there is testing an ambitious new model to focus on rehabilitation and lowering inmate populations. A pilot program is already underway at two of the state's largest prisons. NBC's Steve Patterson got a firsthand look. Steve, so what can you tell us about the state's hopes for this program? Yeah, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation want to make prisons safer. They want to make prisons better. They want to make rehabilitation more worthwhile for the prisoners that in a lot of ways get released back onto the streets. So in a lot of ways, they want to make the streets in California safer as well. Locals are dubbing this program Prisneyland. It's happening at two facilities in Central California, and we got essentially exclusive, really rare access to take a look ourselves. Here's what we found. 
From a distance, it's exactly what you would expect. Big fence, barbed wire, and of course, gun towers, like a prison postcard or something. So it's uh, nine, about 9 o'clock in the morning. We're about 10 minutes away from going inside to Valley State Prison, supposedly one of the most progressive prisons in all of the country. Uh, the nickname is Prisneyland, although from the outside, uh, it looks pretty standard. But we'll see what the inside looks like. Let's go. Thank you. Right inside, not much difference. <laughs> this is the deadly high voltage electric fence, apparently. I uh, obviously don't want to touch this. But the more you get to know Prisneyland, which officials say some locals refer to it as, you realize the first barriers coming down aren't actually physical. And as we were talking, we don't really call them inmates here. Incarcerated individuals. Incarcerated individuals. And that's where the differences between this prison and others around California just begin. Violence plagues our country's system of incarceration. When people get out, they have extreme difficulties finding a job. And while the data varies state by state, about half end up back in custody within a few years. All of that is why officials say the Golden State is trying to move in a new direction, starting a pilot program at two facilities with the goal to replicate the results in Scandinavia, where Norway says reforms over the last two Two and a half decades have brought down the rate of reoffending within two years to only 20 percent, much lower than here in the U.S. They've also decreased the prison population significantly and have helped people reincorporate into society after they serve their time. You have a key to your own cell. Yeah, everybody has their own key. Authorities here say the most important thing they're trying to change at Valley State Prison is how it feels. Well, this is the central courtyard. Yeah. I feel very peaceful just looking at it. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah. Am I recording? <laughs> You're on, man. Officials told us the only way to truly understand the reforms is by coming and experiencing them. One of the principles of the California model is normalization. And, and the idea is we want to make the environment inside our institutions as, as normal as possible with the goal of not releasing somebody who's institutionalized, but releasing citizens back to the community who have practiced normal pro-social behavior. What about the argument that somebody might see this and say, well, isn't part of the goal punishment in some way? Why give them all of this nice stuff? So I, I would say that people go to court to be punished. That's up to our, our judges and our juries. And when they, when they come into our institutions, our goal is to basically help them become better citizens. So with, with that in mind, we are not in the punishment business. Um, we're in the rehabilitative yeah, business. Yeah. I found it. A big part of that rehabilitation, a wide array of programs where the population learns a variety of coping and calming skills. And she is a good horse. Did you know you were going to be grooming horses in prison? <laughs> no. To be honest, I thought I'd be uh, stuck in a cell, maybe a few re uh, rehabilitation groups, but it helps me, you know, cope with, you know, a lot of stresses I deal with, you know, day to day here yeah. in prison. The hope is that creating a more positive environment makes the men locked up here more willing to rehabilitate. Of the total incarcerated population of 3,000 here, the prison says 2,400 are enrolled in training or education programs, including high school and college. This day is the first day of the rest of our lives. We can start our day at any time. When you came in and you saw what this was, what was your impression? I thought I was going to come to prison and get worse, but coming to prison actually saved my life. Wow. Say it again. Coming to prison saved my life. Since they started running these programs in 2017, Valley State Prison says it's reduced violence compared to other peer facilities. According to reports from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, prisons across the state have seen between 15 and 32 homicides total each year between 2017 and 2021. At Valley State, zero. And only one recorded assault or battery against staff versus the hundreds at other facilities. Get in the middle, you guys are going to okay. circle me. All one right. of the most successful programs is dog training. Inmates working with puppies to become service dogs eventually sent to help people across the country. You know, for a long time, we were releasing uh, citizens back into the community that had not improved their thought process. Uh, they had not re rehabilitated from their behavior. And they go out and reoffend. And so... When you start to introduce rehabilitative programs, when you start to introduce hope into this community, you, you really are transforming their thought process. We followed a few of the dog trainers back to their cells. The doors lock from the outside, but they look a little more like something else. Feels like a dorm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Did you expect that when you came in? No. So right now we are walking your dog past the pool table back to your spot in prison. It's pretty wild. So is this like the dog wing? It almost feels like to a lot of people that might watch this that... They're too easy on us. Yes. Uh, I would say uh, no, because a lot of us worked our ways down. Sure. So um, I came from a higher level and it took me seven years to come down to, to this. People that are gonna see this and say, shouldn't prison be a punishment? In some way. It should be reformation too, but it should also be, it should suck, right? Yeah, so this doesn't suck. It does suck. It does suck. Okay, does tell suck. me why. It does suck, right? I don't, I don't get to hug my family. Right. Would you rather want somebody coming out and getting reformed or somebody coming in and getting out the same way they came in or worse? You know, it is important to say that this is still so early in the program's life. We're still essentially in a pilot testing phase of this program. It's, again, only happening at two out of California's more than 30 prisons across the state. What does it look like when you scale that up? We simply don't know yet. But that's why the access that we got was so important. We were able to show a whole lot more, especially about the women's prison, which is across the street running the same program, the vocational training that they have inside, as well as a prisoner who was released after more than 10 years inside prison because of this program. All that and more coming up uh, as we did a whole lot more reporting. Back to you. Very cool and revealing access. Steve Patterson, thanks for that reporting. And finally tonight, the 13-year-old gamer who managed to do something which was unthinkable for decades. He actually broke Tetris. NBC's Steve Patterson has more on how the final bricks fell. Please crash. To the tiny triumphant sounds of bleeps, bloops, and a near-complete nervous breakdown. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh. You're witnessing one of the proudest moments in the history of video games. Tetris finally toppled yes. by human hands. I'm gonna pass out. The guy totally freaking out is Oklahoma's teenage Tetris whiz, Willis Gibson. I can't feel my fingers. Under the gamer handle Blue Scooty, the 13-year-old prodigy scoring so high, the game could no longer function, reaching its oh once God. mythical kill screen in just 38 minutes at level 157. I was just sort of shocked and just happy that I, I did it. Tetris! <laughs> Tetris and its beautiful blocks have been falling into our hearts for nearly 40 years. The rules are simple. Fit the falling shapes into solid rows. As the levels rise, Tetris tumbles faster and faster. The team believed to be the first person to beat the game. So historic, the CEO of Tetris calling it a feat that defies all preconceived limits of this legendary game. Willis says it took a lot of practice. The win dedicated to his dad, who tragically died in December. I'm dedicating it to my dad. He was always very supportive, and I think he'd be proud. Tearing down an icon brick by brick. Yes! A game-breaking victory just falling into place. Oh Steve Patterson, NBC News. Oh, congrats to him. That does it for us tonight. I'm Emily Ikeda. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.